Hello, my name is Wade Nomura, and this is Rotary Serving Our Community. Rotary's uh, had the unique opportunity to do a lot of things around the world, and one of those is uh, to take care of people that have been involved with catastrophe or disaster. With us today, we have Shelterbox, one of our partnering groups. Uh, we have the president of Shelterbox United States, Carrie Murray. Welcome, Thank you, Carrie. Ray. Thank you so much. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, okay. So, well, um, you're probably wondering how a girl who grew up on a Christmas tree farm in Connecticut <laughs> wound up as president of an international humanitarian organization. Um, I uh, am privileged to live here in this community of Santa Barbara, California, and I serve as a member of the Montecito Rotary Club. And I got involved in disaster relief and really helping families who've lost everything in disaster and crisis back in 2009. And I was working for a large corporation at the time for 14 years, GlaxoSmithKline. And I was working with them in Europe and the United States when the president of that organization had said, we're going to take a handful of em employees from around the world and we're going to send you on assignments because you know that you know, there's so many aid organizations doing great work, but they don't always have the professional skills and the resources to do kind of the work that big corporations do. So we're going to embed you in nonprofits. And I was sent to work at a disaster relief organization. And I was two months into my assignment when the earthquake in Haiti hit in 2010. And I was deployed to Haiti. And the first aid organization that I saw on the ground when I went to Haiti was Shelterbox. And it was an interesting situation for me at that time because I was serving as a corporate volunteer and I was th thrown into the throes of one of the biggest emergencies our world has ever seen. And so fast forward, um, what was supposed to be a six month corporate assignment, and it's really become my life's work, is working with aid organizations and helping really people and families who've lost everything with just the basic needs. And, and so that's kind of fast forward <laughs> through my professional life, but um, I'm privileged to serve on behalf of this organization. Sounds good. So tell us a little bit about Shelterbox. So Shelterbox was founded in the year 2000. It was a Rotary Club project, which has now transformed into one of the world's largest organizations that provides shelter and basic essential supplies in emergencies and in conflict situations. And it is the official project partner of Rotary International in emergencies. And the organization really fits the specific need around providing emergency shelter. And in emergencies, there are basic needs that people have. And they're, they're really defined as four different things. It's food, it's water, it's shelter, and it's access to medical care. And Shelterbox saw at the time, in the year 2000, when it was founded by these Rotarians, it found that there were very few organizations actually bringing in emergency shelter. A lot of groups bringing in food, a lot of groups bringing in medicine, but not many focused on shelter. And so it, the premise was, what are the basic things that you need if you've lost everything? If you've lost your home, what are the things that you need in the immediate aftermath to set up a household? And so those items were initially contained in a box, a green box, hence the name shelter box. And within the box are the basic things that you need to sustain your life, non-food items. So it starts with, we call the center of gravity, which is the actual physical home, the tent. It's a humanitarian aid tent that is only made for these catastrophic situations. It can withstand 100 kilometer an hour winds and rain. Uh, and it can hold six to 10 people. And that's the place that they'll call home for a matter of weeks or maybe even months or sometimes longer. In addition, you see basic instruments like solar lights. So oftentimes when you have a disaster, you've lost power, you have contamination of water source, light becomes critically important. So we put solar lights inside the boxes. Also things like water purification units, uh, basic things like ground mats, blankets, warm weather gear, uh, a toolkit. So in disasters, you often see people literally digging out with their bare hands. So things like gloves and rope, a hammer, a handsaw. Uh, in addition, there's a children's activity set. So often when you've lost your home, you see these communities, they've lost churches, they've lost schools. So activities to keep kids going again. Um, and then basic cooking equipment, even enabling families to have stainless steel equipment to begin to cook some of the food that's brought in mosquito nets and other essential items. And 
since that time, since the year 2000, the organization has responded to nearly 300 emergencies. It's assisted over a million people. And we've moved from the box to even beyond the box with many other items that we that we support, whether it's shelter kits and other palletized aid, but all around the premise of supporting the immediate needs related to shelter in the aftermath of a major disaster. It could be an earthquake, it could be a tsunami, a hurricanes, floods, or it could be civil unrest. It could be conflict situations, which has been the majority of the organization's work, really, when you just look at the protracted response in Syria, big piece of our work since 2012. Mm. Interesting. So it's not just all natural disasters then. You go well above and beyond that. We do. And uh, what's amazing about and really differentiates ShelterBox is that we deploy, and since we were founded, we deploy civilian volunteers. Many of them are Rotarians, but we have a disaster relief training facility where we train civilian volunteers who apply to become what's called SRTs, ShelterBox Response Team Members. And they are the most, probably the most highly trained people in all of disaster response. It takes about a year to go through the program. One in 30 people will make it through. We have teachers, nurses, doctors, professors, all walks of life. And they deploy alongside our operation staff in an emergency. And they are continuously trained. Uh, many of them, as I mentioned, are Rotarian. And you know that is also a huge tie that binds and a differentiator for this organization is because of the massive network of Rotary around our world, it's often Rotarians at the local level when an emergency happens that really connect ShelterBox. And in so many different ways, from the logistics and the supply chain challenges that come with emergencies to basic things like hot meals, volunteers, translators, but they really help connect this organization and, and really enable the life-saving work of ShelterBox. So um, it's a very dynamic and, and unique organization, and as I mentioned, largely fueled by the participation of Rotarians. Great. Let's jump into some of the pictures you brought sure. um, with us. Um, first picture, um, is a picture of a camp. Um, mm -hmm. You want to tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah. So this, uh, these, these photos on the first page uh, are really are indicative of the response um, in for the Syrian refugee crisis. And this one in particular is Iraq, Kyrgyzstan, okay. and the situation in Syria has become so immense. It's more people displaced than even World War II. Mm -hmm. And you have internally displaced people within Syria. And we saw the fall of Aleppo in, in late December. And you also have refugees, millions of refugees that have fled. So this picture is actually in Iraq in a, in a camp that was set up. And you see children in these photos. And you know what's interesting and unique about this photo is, is that this is their home and this is their life now. And you see the clothes hanging out to dry. You see the children walking in the camp. And this is the reality of where these children will likely grow up. They're mm. likely to be in this situation for a very long time. Um, you know, it also, this, this photo speaks to me because we know that this is a, they're calling it a generation that will not have gone to school, these children mm. in Syria who've wow. been displaced. And, and what's very unique about the work of ShelterBox is often it's focused on shelter as in physical home, but oftentimes you'll see our tents are often used for other purposes, and that could also be to educate children in a school-type environment or you know, used as a clinic. And in Syria in particular, last year our organization we work with there, Hand in Hand for Syrian Relief Aid, um, had found about 50 children that were in a cave, and they were learning in a cave, in a dark cave, it wasn't ventilated. And when they found these groups, these children learning, uh, we asked them what they needed. And it was basic things like composition books and school equipment and a tent. And so through our partners, ShelterBox was able to su support them with some tents and some school equipment to get these kids engaged again. But it's really, again, just the basic needs these folks have. And, the idea is not always to set up a camp setting. Right. 
you want to, typically in a disaster, we're bringing the tent to be adjacent to where the home site was that was lost. You literally right. want to physically bring a family back together there. Right. But oftentimes in these situations, especially conflict situations, you will see camps. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a tough situation because it's not an easy place um, to live in these camps because it's long protracted and they're likely to be there for, for many years. Yeah, for many years. Uh, mm -hmm. So unlike most of your other projects, this became somewhat permanent then as far yeah. as... Mm -hmm. uh, potential living conditions. Mm -hmm. The next picture again shows the uh, a, a group or one mm -hmm. of the lines of tents again in, in Iraq I presume? Yes this is a, again uh, a, a picture of some tents in the camp. What's interesting here is you see the sun and you see the, the, the little porch and patio, mm -hmm. and that's there for a purpose. Again, again, when these are designed, it's what are the basic things that people need to set up household? And in many of these areas, especially in dry, arid conditions, lots of sun, they need the comfort of a little shade, right? right? So this is just a little patio area mm -hmm. okay. where they'll be able to sit out during the day. There's a front door, there's a back door, there's windows to get ventilation in there. And inside these tents, there are even room dividers. There oh, are wow. basically, yes, there are sheets that come down that enable you to actually have some privacy and kind of separate the tent into different living quarters. Now, you said these, uh, the footprint of this roughly is 17 feet across, is yes, that correct? Yes, roughly 17 by size. 17 when it's put together. There are different versions of the tent depending on the environmental situation in, that the tent is being deployed in. Uh, but this is what's considered a standard relief tent for okay. shelter box. Okay. You also see the, the rotary lake logo on the, each of the right, tents. Right, right. Yes, and in some circumstances, um, especially now within Syria, you won't see the name of the organization on the tents that actually go into some conflict zones just for the, the safety and security of the Understood. folks that we're supporting. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Next picture, um, picture of the Philippines, I believe. Yes. A little more um, tropical here. Yeah, this is, I'm glad you included this photo. Um, the Philippines, and this was Typhoon Haiyan, Typhoon Haiyan remains the strongest storm ever recorded to make landfall in the world. And that devastated parts of the Philippines. And this was a really interesting deployment because uh, our teams, our response teams, went to some of the most remote islands. And that's often what the challenge and the task is for the shelter box response team members, is they get sent out by typically the UN shelter cluster and emergencies to the most remote areas because these are highly trained, very nimble volunteers that have, are, have very deep capabilities within emergency response. And this is uh, indicative of when the areas where everything was destroyed. Homes were destroyed and you saw tents going up in many communities across the Philippines and in some of the most remote islands. And so truly, again, incredible work to help people who were just caught in this huge cr crisis that devastated parts of the Philippines. Great. And then the next picture we have, a um, picture, I believe, of North Korea. Is it that correct? Is, yes. Uh, it was a response that Shelterbox did last year. And North Korea had significant flooding and horrific cold, cold winter conditions. And families that otherwise would never have been served or helped without the help of Shelterbox. And what's interesting about North Korea, many people are surprised that we will actually work in North Korea. And that was actually through a Rotarian contact that we had in Shanghai years ago. There was a disaster and they had asked aid organizations to respond. And Shelterbox was one of the few aid organizations we're non-governmental, we're apolitical, we're non-religious, and if there is an opportunity for us to go serve families who otherwise would not be served or helped, we will do that. So we went in through a contact that the Rotarian had in Shanghai to the Office of Emergency Management in North Korea, and we were, have been allowed peacefully into that country mm. to serve these families. Outstanding. Yeah. Um, notice too on that one, uh, there is a rotary um, insignia on that one, so I guess yeah. that was yeah. not a conflict issue there. No, and we Good. brought those in and can, yeah, and have responded there on a few occasions now. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Next picture we have is uh, Malawi, right? Malawi. Uh, of all the photos that we have uh, in shelter box, this is one of my favorites, <laughs> and it speaks to the hopefulness and the optimism of these women, these ladies uh, carrying the box, 125 pounds. Some of these <laughs> ladies, individuals, actually carried the boxes on their heads. Oh and they carried the boxes two kilometers to set up their home wow. site. And the strength and the fortitude of these ladies. And 
in Malawi, they had suffered from some of the worst flooding that that country had ever seen. And we were the first shelter-based organization that showed up after the flooding. And with the support, and it's oftentimes it's not shelter box alone, but support with other NGOs, mm -hmm. um, we were able to do this response and help thousands of families set up household again. Um, it was also a very well-known response for the organization because of these devices, which are called Luminates. And uh, we include, as one of the components within the box, we include many of these Luminate lights. And it's an LED light. And basically, it's, it ships flat, and it basically blows up like a beach balloon, and the light diffuses and can provide hours and hours of lights. There's different settings. But uh, we had provided these lights, and about a year before, uh, we, had, we had, we'd been partnering with this organization for years, a couple of design school students who went to Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, and they saw that in many of the camps, you see gender-based violence, and light becomes incredibly right. important for safety. And so they created these lights, and they took the lights on the show Shark Tank. And they had been working with, with Shelterbox at the time, as well as Doctors Without Borders, and they thought that there was an application in the recreation space. So they took it in uh, early 2015 onto Shark Tank. They had offers from all four sharks. They partnered with Mark Cuban, and then come a year later in 2016 in January, Mark Cuban and the team from Shark Tank said, we don't want to showcase how we've helped a business double or triple their business. We want to talk about how we partnered with an organization that continues to do great work in the world. And so they sent the team from Shark Tank with Shelterbox and Luminated back to Malawi to document the response there that had taken place over the previous wow. year. It was incredible. That is nice. Yeah, <laughs> That's so, a good story there. Yeah. <laughs> Next picture shows... Um, Picture the uh, map of the world there with your distribution. Yes, yes. That's very impressive. It's massive. So people often say, ask, you know, how we respond, where we respond, why we respond, and really, the organization has uh, some. We have some guidelines on whether or not we mount a response. The first is we look at is international aid being requested. Uh, we look at do we have the the logistics and supply chain to be able to get the products into the country. And we look at, are there a minimum, we like to say, are there a minimum of 200 families that will be displaced for a minimum of 30 days? Hmm. And it's, it's not you know, a hard rule, but it's a guide for us. And so you can see we've responded across the world, including the U.S. We've responded here in Moore, Oklahoma, and those Midwest tornadoes. We've responded in Katrina, in Superstorm Sandy. And then we've also responded in, in nearly 100 more countries. Mm. And so it's been a massive response um, that's enabled the organization to serve, at this point, just over a million people. Uh, that will be growing exponentially. And so right now, the numbers show that there are about 85 million people displaced in our world. And that's 60 million people through conflict and about 25 million through natural disaster. Mm. By 2025, it's estimated that number will be 200 million. And so as an organization, Shelterbox has actually been doing, uh, over the past several years, really looking at logistics, supply chain, and how can we scale up our organization to serve more people. And so we've been doing just that. And we anticipate by the year 2025, we're going to serve 10 times the number of families that we currently serve mm. annually. Wow. And so the need is growing and our organization is growing. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Next picture, we have a picture shows the, um, a kit, one of the kits yes. Uh, yes. expanded out. Looks pretty impressive. Uh, most of it you have here, mm -hmm. I see. But uh, anything else that you want to point out in that kit? Well, most people want to know how much does the box weigh? It's 125 pounds. <laughs> how much does it cost? It's $1,000 delivered. Okay. And those are the essential items that a family needs to set up a household. And this is the classic box. So Got it's it. the tent, the mosquito nets, the lights, the water purification units, the cooking equipment, just general items to help support the building of the household again. And in okay. addition to the box, we've also expanded to include shelter kits, which are repair kits. So if you haven't lost your whole home, and say you've lost in a storm, you've lost the roof, you've lost walls. We have general repair kits with tarpaulins and tools to basically help you reinforce and repair the home till you can move towards you know, the intermediate reconstruction, long-term reconstruction of the home. 
Got it. Now, is there any food that's included in this? Or is that something? No. Outside? So there, there. It's this is all considered the basic shelter as well as essential household items, but non-food items. Gotcha. However, as you can see, we do include the cooking equipment. Right. And you'll right. see the cooking equipment here. And I think what's interesting is that um, we just, I heard today from some folks that are working in Somaliland. And so you've probably heard about, obviously, horrible famines that are ha happening right there in the Horn of Africa. And we have a team deployed to, to some Somaliland right now. And then when they were driving down the road yesterday, in the distance, they saw some tents and they saw the rotary wheel. They saw the rotary wheel and the shelter box logo and they stopped. The last time we deployed to Somaliland was 2009. Hmm. And they got out and what they found was the tents that we had provided, one of them was used as a little cafe and it was a 21 year old woman <laughs> selling tea. And she said she makes the finest tea in all of Somaliland. <laughs> nice. And um, it just shows you that these boxes and the items within them, whether it's the cooking equipment or the tent, they often get upcycled or they, they get used right. permanently as that you set up household or sometimes they become other things. And in this case, it was used to help set up a business. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Next picture we have is a picture of one of the distribution sites that you have. Yes, yeah, so the, I think one of the most important things to know about disaster relief is that you can't do in disasters what you don't do otherwise. Right. And you can't show up on the worst day ever and expect to be effective and efficient and do this well if you don't do it all the time. And so the organization has become very, very good at the prepositioning and preparedness of what's needed on the worst day ever. And what you see here is a distribution center. And literally, our supplies, whether it's shelter boxes, shelter kits, school kits, we preposition these products in UN depots, DHL warehouses, and hubs around the world, from Dubai to our warehouse in the UK to Moore, Oklahoma, Panama, the Philippines, Singapore, we preposition these. So on the worst day ever, we have supplies all over the globe that we can draw down upon. Great, uh, outstanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how many, by the way, how many of those distribution sites do you have, would you guess? They're worldwide? always changing. Um, they're always changing. It, right now it's probably roughly about a dozen and those change okay. and they will continue to change as we grow and expand the organization. Uh, but and we oftentimes, even in addition, in addition to the large pre-positioning centers, we oftentimes will store a select number of products and kits with local it, locally. And that includes um, last year, the second storm ever recorded to make landfall in the world was Cyclone Winston, which, which hit Fiji. It was the strongest ever on the southern hemisphere. The first items we actually had on the ground on the main island were pre-positioned shelter boxes that were stored with a local Rotary Club. Mm. So you often will see, in addition, we've, we have you know, Rotarians that act as consignees. We have at least one per country that we work in, and we often see that Rotarians will help pre-position these items <laughs> for us. Very nice. That's great. Next picture we have shows some of the different models that uh, you offer, I guess, based on Climate, geography? Yes. So, we, you know, the, the products we provide are truly meant to serve the unique needs in every disaster and community. And that's why we've grown so far beyond the box. And then we have different physical tents to meet the needs of the environmental situations in which they're going to be deployed. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see the standard family relief tent, which mm -hmm. is the tent that actually goes into a standard shelter box. Adjacent to that, to the right, is considered a Flex 3. Now, this is the tent that we deployed to North Korea. And so inside it, you'll see a whole thermal layer that is built mm. in the inside of the tent. It's like a tent within a tent. So it's insulated then. It's, it provides an extra level of ins insulation for really cold weather. You, au you also see a stove for heating and cooking that's inside and really special warm weather gear that's included as part of that set. Got it. Uh, underneath that, you see the OAS tent, uh, a smaller version of the tent, uh, very much more lightweight, less expensive, easy to deploy. And to the left of that, you see a shelter kit. And those are the repair kits. Uh, we deploy thousands of those each year. And actually, from that bag, you can create a single room structure. Oftentimes, mm. we procure items locally. So it could be corrugated iron. It could be some local timber. But from that, we've seen in Ecuador last year with the earthquake, we deployed thousands of these kits. And you can create a single room structure. Mm. Or you can repair a house that's been right. damaged. 
Very from good. that. Now, we also next have uh, an article that showed up in the Rotarian yeah. magazine, so yeah. we have a little bit of time to go through this. Okay. If you want to go through, um, I believe it's a three-page, uh, actually six pages, correct? Or Yes. So yeah. the Rotarian magazine did an excellent profile on the work of Shelterbox, but really focused on the role that Rotary has played to enable the life-saving work of this organization. And it told it through the eyes of some response team members who are Rotarian, who've deployed all over the world in some of these disaster and conflict situations. And I think what has been so great about the relationship with Rotary is that not only are you know, Rotarians at clubs around the world helping and really help by mobilizing and supporting the organization with critically needed donations. We couldn't do this work without, without donations. So we're privately funded and it's because Rotarians care to give. Yes, they give on the worst day ever, but in the US we have a program called the Heroes Program. And we have many clubs that become hero members and they give an annual contribution to support this work. So from the mobilization of the resources to fulfill the mission to actually folks that are on the ground deploying as response team members, serving as ambassadors, raising awareness of the work at churches and at community centers and its classrooms, to actually helping on the ground, physically facilitating a response. Um, it's, the, it's a huge tie that binds this organization. Um, I've had the privilege many times of going to Evanston, Illinois, and meeting with my colleagues at Rotary International. And you know, when you really think about you know, our, our president right now, John Germ, and the theme, Rotary Serving Humanity, I think there's no better way that that's exemplified than the partnership that you see between Rotary and Shelterbox, helping the world's most vulnerable people on the absolute worst days ever. And it's just been a terrific, terrific relationship that really, I think, only becomes um, more visible. And I'm really, it really is exciting as a Rotarian and as a, obviously a member of the Shelterbox staff, I'm just so happy about the integration of these organizations and coming together to serve humanity. Great. One real quick question at sure. the end. Um, mm -hmm. Rotary, was that something you started into or was that something you joined from Shelterbox? So what's interesting is I learned about Rotary because I serve as a board member for an international organization, but it's also based locally. It's called Girls Rock and it empowers girls through music. And it takes girls six to 16, it puts them in bands and it really helps build their confidence and self-esteem. And in serving for that organization, I went to accept a, a local Rotary Club check on behalf of that organization. Great. And I knew when I sat there at that luncheon that I was gonna be, be a member of that club. Great. And I've never <laughs> looked back. It's, it's had such a huge impact on my life and I love being a Rotarian. Great, okay, well thanks very much for sharing Shelterbox sure. and all the great things you're doing there. Um, we would like to, you know, highlight it and hopefully get some more pictures of that. Okay. And so uh, we, we're looking forward to working with you more in the future. Great. With that, everybody, thank you uh, very much for your time taking a look at this. As you can see, shelter box goes well beyond the temporary solutions. It goes on and includes those people in conflict. So with that, again, take a look at shelter box, and we will see you again next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.